the town of Tvarsaba. Khirbet Sufin. The Mosque of Kalkilya, an Arab town which until 1967 had been on the Jordanian side of the armistice line. From Kalkilya to the sea lies the narrow wasteline of the state of Israel. The town of Tvarsaba, less than three miles from here, the coastal plain, Israel's densely populated heartland. Khirbet Sufin, a Jordanian army post until 1967. Its cannon, which once shelled Tel Aviv. Weeds grow here now. Deep cement line trenches connect the firing positions from which Jordanian gunners once held the vital infrastructure of Israel at their mercy. Today, the cannon stands idle. Khirbet Sufin, only one of many Jordanian army posts overlooking Israel from the heights of the 1967 armistice line, the Green Line. How did this Green Line actually come about? In 1917, the British conquered the land of Israel, then known as Palestine. In 1922, the British gave the eastern and larger portion of the region to the Arabs. This became Transjordan. Today, Jordan. A conflict arose between Jew and Arab over the remaining western portion of the territory. Violence and terror became the order of the day. While claiming national and political rights for the Palestinian Arabs, Arab leaders refused to acknowledge any such rights for the Palestinian Jews. In November 1947, the UN Assembly voted for another partition, this time of western Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. The Arabs threatened war and immediately made good their threat. Meanwhile, the British evacuated the country and on the 14th of May 1948, the Jews proclaimed the establishment of the State of Israel. On the following day, the armies of five Arab nations, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon and Egypt, invaded the newborn state. Jordan captured Judea and Samaria, including the old city of Jerusalem, while the Egyptians held a coastal strip around Gaza. Finally, there was an armistice. The armistice line between the opposing troops became the Green Line. In its first two decades, Israel grew and developed within the confines of the narrow coastal plain at the foot of the Judea and Samaria mountains. Its width varied from 9 to 22 miles. Two-thirds of Israel's population is concentrated in this narrow region. Shortly after the establishment of the state, more than one million Jewish refugees from the Holocaust and from Arab lands arrived in the country. Most of them came here destitute. All of them came here to build a new life and to help build the new state. It is in this strip of land that most of Israel's heavy industry and commerce are centered. International Airport, Israel's main airport and its chief link with the outside world. For 19 years, the Jordanians controlled part of the western portion of the land of Israel. During these 19 years, more than 10,000 border incidents occurred in which Israeli civilians were killed and wounded and property was destroyed. Khirbet Sufins, many points which look down over Israel, controlling its every breath and heartbeat. Nebi Samuel, just east of the Green Line, dominates the capital of Israel, Jerusalem, and its approaches.
this hill dominates Israel's international airport at Lod. From its crest, all incoming and outgoing air traffic can be neutralized. With the country facing an army of hostile Arab nations to the east, the airport has become, in a very real sense, Israel's lifeline. This hill controls the valley of Jezreel, the nation's breadbasket. Israel consists of several long, narrow strips. The Jordan Valley, of the Syrian-African Rift, a depression of 13 to 20 miles wide, bounded by mountains to the east and to the west. Through this valley flows the Jordan River, which empties into the Dead Sea, the world's lowest spot, more than 1,300 feet below sea level. The eastern slope of the Judea-Samaria Mountains. Note the steep gradient from the Jordan Valley up to the watershed. The mountain ridge is two and a half to nine miles wide. There is a climb of about 2,800 feet from the Jordan Valley to the peak of the ridge, over a distance of only 15 to 25 miles. The western slopes, on the other hand, are moderate, descending gradually to the Mediterranean coastal plain. What does all this mean in military terms? The tremendous differences in height on the eastern side of the ridge between the Jordan Valley and the mountaintops within such a short distance create an extremely steep slope. Whoever occupies this mountain range completely dominates the Jordan Valley by sight and by fire. The Jordan River is not a difficult obstacle. Its bridges and passes make the crossing a relatively simple operation. It does, however, require time, a precious military commodity. Once across the Jordan River, an attacking force is severely limited. It can ascend the mountains only along five existing routes. The Jericho-Jerusalem route, the Jericho-Ramallah route, the Ma'ale Ephraim Akraba route, the Damia Bridge Nablus route, the Mechola Tubas route. An attacking force coming from the east is obliged to make its way upward along the narrow valleys. It cannot fan out. While the defenders, even with a small force, can seriously delay the advancing armies. This is the Jericho-Jerusalem route, one of the most important. The attacking force must first cross the Jordan River over the Abdullah or Allenby Bridge then climb 3,600 feet to Jerusalem, situated only some 20 miles away from the river. From various points along this route, such as Ma'ale Adumim, the defenders have complete control over the entire axis. The Damia Bridge Nablus route is the most likely axis for an enemy thrust. A distance of approximately 25 miles separates Nablus from the Damia Bridge. Part of the way, travel is along the deep wide Farah Valley. is completely dominated from the overlooking hills. Its upper portion is a narrow canyon where travel is possible along one side only and along a road easily blocked by a small defending force. Once at Nablus, the road passes between the Ival and Brizi mountains. From Nablus, it is only 29 miles to the coast at Netanya. These routes are clearly of prime strategic importance. A small defending force occupying the ridge and the eastern slopes can prevent or delay even a massive enemy advance. 
once an attacking army arrives at the top of the ridge, however, virtually nothing can stop its advance into the heavily populated coastal areas to the west. All wadis and valleys of the western slopes are suitable for tank travel, being wide and of moderate slope. In order to contain an attacking army streaming down the mountainside, the defender must deploy massive forces. Not only does this take precious time, but these forces, once deployed, can be easily outflanked by the attacker, who can shift his own troops to one of the many alternate routes of advance. Possession of the mountain ridge means two further advantages. One, a route running north-south enables the defender, if necessary, to move rapidly from one axis of attack to another. Two, early warning stations on the mountain ridge, having a wide horizon, can spot attacking enemy planes at a considerable distance eastward. Should these warning stations be installed, not on the mountain ridges, but along the western foothills, attacking aircraft would be visible only once they cleared those ridges, and early warning would be reduced to mere seconds. What then does control of the territory provide? Close control of the Jordan River and its passes means early detection of hostile enemy movements on the eastern bank of the Jordan, and the possibility of effective interception. It means complete control over the Jordan Valley and of the axis leading upwards from it, including the ability of a small defending force stationed on the mountaintop to halt or delay an enemy offensive. Control of the territory also means time, crucial hours and days during which a small defending force can contain an enemy offensive, while reserve units, the major portion of Israel's order of battle, are mobilized to reinforce the defending troops. The battle between defender and attacker will occur at a distance from Israel's population centers. Early warning stations on the mountain ridges provide visual control over the length and breadth of the territory. This means precious warning time, time that can make all the difference. A withdrawal of the Israeli defense forces from Judea and Samaria to the 1967 Green Line would enable an aggressor from the east, whose forces are always at hand, to advance unhampered from the Jordan Valley to the Green Line. Any such move would oblige Israel at once to mobilize all of its reserves, bringing the country virtually to a standstill. Thus, even a small enemy force would be able to cause serious damage to Israel with almost no effort. Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, and its approaches would be under constant threat. Israel's main international airport would be paralyzed. No plane would be able to land or take off. The fertile fields of the Jezreel Valley would be threatened. The metropolitan industrial complex of Tel Aviv would be under the constant menace of enemy guns. Israel's narrow waistline from Tul Karam to Netanya would be cut in a matter of minutes. Will Israel's borders revert once again to Khirbet Sufin? Will Khirbet Sufin once again be a hostile enemy position? Or shall the weeds continue to grow at the base of that cannon?